Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Travel Talks. English screen sharing. Yeah. And welcome to everyone who's watching this on the recorded version on YouTube eventually. Welcome to everyone joining us. And it's our pleasure this morning to have Maya, Maya Evans with us. Thank She's you. going to talk about to Afghanistan. Um, Maya is the UK coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. And she's going to talk to us about that. Um, so Maya is actually speaking to us from Hastings, just out of interest. So, okay, Maya, we will hand over to you now. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, well, thank you for joining me today. Um, I've put together a bit of a unique talk because normally when I do talks about Afghanistan, um, as an anti-war activist running a peace organization, I very much focus on the sort of socio-political aspect of what's going on in the country. Um, but as you're a group who are more sort of used to travel talks, um, I thought I'd try and sort of um, brighten it up a bit and give more of a sort of general talk in the first half about Afghanistan and give you kind of like a flavor for the culture and the history. And then in the second half, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about the sort of political, um, uh, economic aspects of what's going on in the country at the moment. So um, I'll start off with, let's see, what was my first slide? Okay, so I thought I'd start off with a little bit, a brief history of Afghanistan. So. If you look at the map, the sort of inner green outline, that's the border of Afghanistan. And as you can see, it's, it's landlocked and it's surrounded by other countries. It borders Pakistan, Iran, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and believe it or not, it even borders China. Um, and then the red lines that you can see, these are actually the uh, routes of the Silk Road. So um, going back as, as early as I, as I could, um, Afghanistan was actually one of the key locations for the, for the Silk Road. Um, one of the trading ports was in Bagram, which some of you may have heard of because there's now a quite an infamous, I don't know if it's still there actually, I think it is still there, it's a US military base in Bagram and it, it became kind of well known um, about 15 years ago when there was an incident of two Afghans being tortured, you know, tortured to death in Bagram. But back in the day when uh, they, they had the Silk Road, um, it was this incredible trading post. It was um, equidistance between the Chinese Sea, the China Sea and the Mediterranean. And so you'd have this incredible sort of, uh, you know, like all, all trading um, routes, you'd have an incredible exchange of political ideas, of theory, um, of, of products. So you had things from China being exchanged with things from um, um, the, the Mediterranean. And there's, there was, there's even been a discovery of some, some um, crystals from the Mediterranean back then in Bagram. And there was apparently an amphitheater um, style design where people would gather and obviously socialize. So Afghanistan, it massed a lot of wealth in that period, obviously. Um, and uh, it was also for, for the, the route for Buddhism, which came from India. Oh. Um, to go through to China and Japan. So as you can see, the picture in the right-hand corner, that's the Buddha statue that was formerly in um, Bamiyan, uh, which was uh, infamously destroyed by the Taliban in, I think it was 2000, it was blown up by the Taliban. Um, but this, it was, an, it was originally a Buddhist country. And even before then, it was a center for Zoroastrians, which I found um, incredible. When you think about Afghanistan today, one of the most conservative Islamic countries in the world. So part of Afghanistan's problem, um, obviously its strength as well, of being this central location in the middle of Asia and this trading post that attracted all this wealth from east to west, um, being a central location, it's very strategic for um, invaders, for colonialists to want to control such a country right in the middle of Asia. So it's had various invaders um, over the time. We've got Alexander the Great, who invaded in 330 BC. And um, apparently he deserted some of his army in Nuristan. 
And today it's quite interesting because Nuristan, um, the people there have a very original look there. Lots of them are blonde and blue eyed, which is very unusual for the area. And legend has it that it was Alexander the Great's um, army that was that was sort of deserted there um, and then blended into the society. And that's the genetics that are showing through today. Uh, then you've got Genghis Khan in the 11th century, um, and he was obviously a notorious um, emperor who, who went on a killing spree across Afghanistan. And still today, there's a city in Afghanistan which, which is called the City of Screams. So, um, you know, obviously they, they swept across the country, murdering a lot of people. Um, and it's still, even though it was in the 11th century, it's still an event that people very much remember today. And the descendants of the uh, Mongolians who invaded then are today known as the Hazara, who are actually one of the, the, the sort of the underclass almost of society in Afghanistan. They're, they were the persecuted ethnic minority under the Taliban, and today they're still very much persecuted. And some of that hostility um, actually comes from them descended, descending from the, the Mongols. Um, and then you have uh, Babur who invaded in 1525, first emperor of the Mughal dynasty. And I've actually been to the Babur Gardens in Kabul, which is one of, the, it's almost like this, this, this fantastic um, uh, dynastic garden that's frozen in time with all these terraces and all these fantastic rose gardens and um, trees that stretch up a hillside. And at the bottom, there's this old swimming pool that's completely empty now, it's, it's been drained. There's photographs from the 70s of people swimming in this swimming pool. And then as you walk into the sort of initial area, there's, there's the kind of um, flea market almost with people who have laid out blankets and they're selling bits of jewelry, lapis lazuli, um, uh, quartz, all these kind of things um, on, on bits of blankets, dusty blankets. And then you, you walk through the garden and it's, it's, de it's definitely a little, it's still a very romantic retreat where young people will come for sort of discreet romantic walks through the garden. And it still very much has that kind of Persian feel of sort of a relaxed atmosphere, very romantic, um, people whispering poetry in one another's ears, um, that kind of thing. So that was, that was a, um, a, 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 a kind of monument of what, what Barbour left behind. And then the last picture that represents um, the Free Anglo-Afghan Wars, which took place between 1839 and 1919. And this was part of the Great Game, which is they called it at the time. Um, and that was wanting to control Afghanistan as a buffer zone between um, Russia and India. So obviously India was Britain's most lucrative colony at the time. And they were very paranoid about Russia coming in. So they wanted the buffers, they wanted to control the buffer zone of Afghanistan. And the picture um, in the corners of Dr. Bryden in 1842, um, after a very famous uh, battle whereby the Afghans killed 16,000 um, uh, people from the, from the British side who had taken up camp in Kabul. And the Afghans were, were very suspicious of them and there was sort of feelings of hostility mounted. And then it broke eventually when some, apparently some, some British soldiers took some Afghan women um, for, for some uh, leisure activity, should we say. And word spread and within a weekend, um, thousands of Afghans descended on the city, drove this army out of Kabul into a mountain pass and um, slaughtered them. So uh, that's, that's, it, that was quite a famous battle that Afghans still talk about today because obviously uh, Britain was at the height of its colonial power. It was the only time I think in British history during that period that the, the Brits were actually beaten abroad because they were obviously such a, um, a, a mighty army at the time. So a bit more of a whistle stop tour. You have the 1920s. And there was um, a monarch, King Amanullah Khan and his wife Soraya. And he was very much sort of like a modernist monarch. He was very inspired by um, of the West. He came to Britain and he, he quite fancied Rolls Royces and, and things like that. And he passed a, a, a raft of progressive perform, um, reforms, uh, which, which encouraged equality, education for men and women, uh, he had a kind of moderate constitution and he ruled for about 10 years and his wife was very keen on, on women's equality and she helped to shape some of the policy around that. 
but the turning point came when uh, Queen Soraya was uh, photographed. I think it's this actual photograph that's up here. And the picture was distributed in a bazaar, the market um, in Kabul. And there was such outrage over seeing a woman who wasn't veiled and also obviously showing her arms that the conservative uh, mullahs in the, in the rural areas descended on the, the, the city, drove the monarch out and he fled and lived, in, he lived his life out in exile. Um, so after that new monarch came in and he obviously got rid of all those reforms and there was a, it was, it was slow, I would say Afghanistan was slowly progressive within that period. You've got pictures of Kabul here in the 1970s. Um, it was an, it, interestingly, um, in the 1920s or ni 1919, women in Afghanistan got the vote. Uh, and that was actual universal suffrage, which was ahead of Britain, uh, believe it or not, who declared suffrage, but it wasn't universal, as we know, it was for initially for the middle class women. So in this period, Afghanistan was actually ahead um, of, of, of Britain. And then after the 1920s onwards with more of a kind of conservative rule, it was sort of a slow progression of, of, of modernization. Uh, there was always this big difference between Kabul um, and the rural areas of Afghanistan, which is the case in, in most countries where the, the sort of central cities are much more progressive. Um, and as you can see here in the 70s, it was a heyday, um, the women, many of the sort of probably more middle class women walked around in, in uh, knee length skirts. It was a bit of a hot spot for the hippie trail. I normally get, when I do talks, I normally get people um, who visited Afghanistan in the 70s as part of the hippie trail and have very fond memories of this wonderful, hospitable culture. So, you know, you go to an Afghan person's house and immediately the, the tea comes out and then various dishes, bis we start off with maybe some biscuits and some nuts and um, raisins, kishmish, and, and then bit by bit, more and more sort of platters come out, more and more food. And uh, whenever you go to an Afghan person's house, you, you, you never leave hungry or able to, to, to consume anything more. Because there's a very strong code of hospitality in Afghanistan. It even goes to the extent that when you enter someone's house, they then protect you with their life. So for an Afghan, if you are in their protection, they will put their lives on the line for you. That's how, you know, that's the kind of standard of hospitality that Afghans have and nothing is too much trouble for the guests. So it was very well liked by a lot of travelers who were going, you know, through Afghanistan to India in the 70s. And, and lots of people actually say that Afghanistan was their favorite place um, when they traveled along the hippie trail. And so the, the fates of Afghanistan really turned in 1979. Um, there was a, a, a small sort of communist um, uh, uh, block in Afghanistan and they managed to undertake a coup and overthrow the leadership at the time, but they were very much a minority and they knew that um, they wouldn't be able to hold power in Kabul independently. So they went to the Soviet Union and they said, look, can you help us out? And the Soviet Union undenarred and um, said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll lend our comrades a hand and steamed in with tanks, a decision that they regretted bitterly. Gorbachev later said that it was the invasion of Afghanistan that broke the um, Soviet Union. And they were embroiled in a war for 10 years in Afghanistan, a disastrous war that took the lives of thousands of Russians. They hated being there. They got stranded and eventually they um, deserted 10 years later. And that gave way to um, a civil war where you had various warlords who were previously fighting the Russians, they started fighting each other. Um, and you've got this character here in the, in the, um, at the bottom, Mullah Omar, so he was the founder of the Taliban and um, legend had it that he was, he was fighting, he was part of the um, jihad against Russia. And obviously you've got a lot of international um, jihadists going into Russia, uh, going to Afghanistan at the time to, to fight against the godless Russians, uh, one of which was bin Laden from Saudi Arabia. Um, and Mullah Omar, he was very much, um, he, the story has it that, well, he actually lost his eye fighting the Russians. Uh, apparently he was in a sort of um, shootout and he got shot in the eye and he didn't even blink. Um, and managed to gather himself and continue fighting against the Russians in this um, shootout and, and somehow survived, even though he was one of the only people um, um, with a gun. 
And so he, it, legend has it that he, um, uh, I think it was in the south of Afghanistan and there was some sort of event in a police um, compound where they had abducted some young girls and abused them. And Mullah Omar gathered up some locals who were very angry about this and stormed the compound and uh, killed everyone and managed to rescue the women. They then, th that story then spread um, and he slowly gathered more and more people, sort of like vigilantes who were sick of this kind of lawlessness within Afghanistan. And they swept across the country and managed to take Kabul and they were um, the Taliban. So th there was obviously mixed feelings at the time. Some people thought, oh, well, this could be some stability for this country that's had five years of um, civil war. Um, but obviously the day they came in, they then published all these like long list of um, authoritarian rules that you, you had to follow, which included things like um, not listening to pop music and not being able to fly kites if you were a child and having to grow a beard and women were not allowed to leave the ho homes alone and they had to wear the burqa and things like that. So it was pretty quick that people realized that this was gonna be a very oppressive regime. And then obviously in 2001, 9-11 took place and the US and NATO invaded Afghanistan with the aim of um, capturing bin Laden who was hiding out there. Um, and they also said at the time that they pledged to liberate Afghan women um, and to topple the Taliban. So those were their pledges. Um, obviously 19 years later, I'll talk about the, the peace talks and where we're at. 19 years later, um, they haven't exactly reached um, all of their goals, actually, uh, probably managing to kill bin Laden in 2012, who was actually hiding in a, a compound in Pakistan. Uh, that was probably the, the, their only sort of aim that they managed to meet. Um, so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about some of my adventures. So what I do when I go up to Afghanistan, I um, stay with a youth peace group. So they're mainly sort of teenagers, older teenagers who have grown up under the occupation of US and NATO. And they've all, they've all grown up, uh, no, not all of them. Most of them have grown up in Kabul. The founding members actually were from Bamiyan. Um, and they, uh, so a lot of the Kabul young people, they've managed to access education and they've had, you know, obviously the internet, that is a fantastic access into seeing what the rest of the world is up to. Um, so it's a very different generation to, to what has been before. And um, this, this youth peace team, they have a, um, a peace centre where they do various projects. Uh, they run a street kids school. Um, they talk about nonviolence. They talk about progressive ideas. Uh, and they have, they have lots of different projects on the go. Um, and on one occasion, we get to occasionally go on outings. Because I'm a foreigner, uh, they don't like to let me out very often because obviously it's dangerous, uh, well it's dangerous full stop as Afghanistan is one of the most dangerous countries in the world, um, but also as a foreigner you're, you've got a higher propensity of being kidnapped or for being a, a target. So they're very sort of like mm, uh, reluctant to take me out anywhere, um, but thankfully I, because of my olive complexion, I kind of blend in a bit when I'm wearing a hijab, so I kind of get to go out more than most of the internationals who visit. So these um, are some of the mountains. This is on one occasion, we, we drove out of Kabul and we went to some of the nearby mountains. I think this was in February. So um, during the, the snowy season. And I mean, Kabul is always generally, every time I've been there, it's been blue skies. Um, occasionally when it's a snowy day, you'll have a gray sky, but um, uh, there's about 300 days of blue skies in Afghanistan. And it is, it's, you know, it's as blue as that picture there every day, startling high blue skies. Uh, it's 6,000 feet above sea level, which for me is very difficult. I live in Hastings right by the sea. Um, so I'm obviously very used to a different kind of latitude. And so when I try to exert myself, I get very breathless very quickly. Um, and it's in this sort of, as you can see on the sort of slightly smaller picture, it's in the kind of basin. So it's surrounded by all these fantastic mountains, um, which makes for spectacular views um, and also probably very good for de defensive purposes, but um, really difficult for pollution. So, so today, Afghanistan, well, Kabul is, is one of the most polluted um, cities in the world. It's the only city that still has an open, open sewage system. So um, 
uh, couple that with the sort of very dry um, atmosphere, you get a lot of these kind of, um, uh, you know, a lot of dust that is that consists of fecal matter, basically. Um, and then you have all these cars as well, who are which are traveling on cheap diesel. Um, and yeah, you can sit in a car and just be uh, overwhelmed by the fumes because there's no sort of like, you know, you don't have an MOT for your car. So it's normally belching out some sort of noxious fumes um, and they're using cheap diesel um, to get around. And then also people are burning everything for heat because, you know, obviously if you're poor, um, you just burn whatever's around and more often than not that's plastic. So um, a stove, a wood stove is, is normally the main source of heat for a home. Um, and so people will, will basically burn rubbish, especially if they're in a refugee camp. So it's this kind of mixture of sort of open sewers, um, plastic being burnt in this basin with no sort of wind moving this, moving all the pollution, um, surrounded by mountains. So it's like it's often very heavy. When you when you land in Afghanistan, you breathe in the air. It is this kind of kind of unforgettable taste of sort of diesel and dust and dirt all blended together. It's the unmistakable. Um, carbol taste. Um, so this was us climbing a mountain and um, on the outskirts they have a lot of cemeteries as you can see these are in the um, in the distance there the cemeteries. Um, I was I've been told but I've never found this written on the internet but I was told by friends that these the, the flags uh, the green flags um, denote someone who has died protecting their country so I guess you could say they're martyr flags. Um, and I would say every other tombstone had one of these kind of martyr flags on them. Um, so yeah, this was, it was a very uplifting experience. I was with my young friends and I'd never been mountain climbing before in Afghanistan. Uh, and I was, I was quite taken aback by the style um, of, of how Afghans travel. So Afghans, they are super big fun. They love to do dancing. Um, clapping, any sort of opportunity to have a laugh, Afghans are up for it. And uh, my obviously young people being as they will, um, they decided to go mountain climbing with a huge stereo. Um, I couldn't believe it when, when the, the bus arrived and they all piled on and this, this kind of stereo, this you know, massive PA somebody was carrying. And we got halfway up the mountain and we stopped for a little breather and spontaneously um, a sort of almost like an Afghan rave um, uh, started. And I've got a little bit of footage. It's a bit windy, so um, just bear with me with the sound. And I hope this works. Uh, I'll just let me just check. Yeah, that's still that setting still on. So I, I'll play this. It's just a, it's about thirty seconds of what happened when we stopped for a breather on a hillside in in Kabul. <laughs> That's, uh, that's mountaineering Afghan style. Uh, uh, and similarly, other trips that I've done, I've gone to the Panjshir Valley um, and Panjshir, Panj is five, Shir is lion, so five lion valley. Um, and again, on the bus, the bus is wild fun. I think mainly because you've got teenagers and they're going out for the day and it's, you know, it's a very oppressive, environment in Afghanistan you're not really especially young women women any woman is not, are not allowed to be getting up and having a good time uh, but we get on we get on the bus and uh, the, the music's pumping on the stereo and there's dancing in the aisles as soon as we leave and it was uh, it was it was a very risky experience because we were we were leaving Kabul it's very one of the few occasions we get to leave Kabul and we're on a bus and we're going on all these little windy roads around the mountains in the in Panjshir and outside of Kabul it's a, a very different vibe it's much more it immediately gets a lot more conservative so all of this um, frivolity was unfolding on the bus with people clapping and dancing and we get pulled over by um, a police commander 
And my friends immediately pulled me to the back of the bus. They say, don't say anything, my, if they realize you're British, we're gonna have to pay a vibe, a bribe. And then there's gonna be, we're gonna have to take, maybe we have to go to the police station and then it's gonna be a headache. So the, the police pull us over. I dive to the back of the bus, got my head down. Um, the police officer gets onto the bus and is having a go at these teenagers for, for having all this fun in the countryside. And they, um, um, they take away a drum that someone had bought on the journey and, and was played. They confiscate this drum um, as, as a punishment for all this, this, this frivolity that these young people were having. And uh, the person whose drum it was, he was heartbroken. Um, <laughs> he said when we got back, um, what did the drum do? The drum was the victim of this journey. Um, but it was it was a very memorable day, uh, and it was it was it was fun up to that moment, and we were having a, a, a really good time. Uh, I put this picture of um, a, a wheelbarrow. You can see these kind of like mud. Uh, that's actually kind of they look like mud patties, and inside are grapes. So incredibly, I was amazed by this. Incredibly, um, this is how Afghans store grapes, and they can keep for months by wrapping them up in these kind of mud packs. And um, all along the, the road going to the Panjshir, there were loads of these vineyards. I had no idea that you know, Afghanistan had so many vineyards. And um, I've eaten enough of their, their raisins, their kishmish, one of their favorite snacks. Um, it, but I, I didn't actually put two and two together and realize that they have a serious operation going on in Afghanistan. Actually, up to about 40 years ago, the country was self-sufficient. It was one of the biggest um, exporters of of nuts, of almonds, um, and walnuts, and you know, obviously raisins as well, or, or grapes, which probably at some point may have been turned into wine. But I thought that was very interesting, the way um, grapes were stored. I've never seen that before. And then at the bottom, this was us stopping uh, for a comfort break. And I thought it was quite interesting because in the background, you've got the posters of Akhmer Shir Masood. And so we were actually on our way to see his, his tomb in the Panjshir Valley. And Akhmer Shim said he was a, a, a warlord and he's now considered a bit of a hero in Afghan um, history. He managed to um, uh, keep the Russians at bay. So uh, from the Panjshir Valley, it was the only area that the Russians didn't manage to conquer. And they, they put that down to Akhmer Shir Masood's um, strategic military um, thinking and skills. And this was, if you see the group picture, that was um, all of us lot outside his tomb. And it's a very sort of, you know, a very solemn, sacred experience when you go into the tomb, there's no talking, there's no messing around. It is like utmost respect. Um, and all along the, the roadside, when we were going to the Pantry Valley, you had these abandoned tanks. So these are the Russian tanks. Um, still everywhere dotted along the landscape of, of, of Afghanistan, where when the Russians left in 1989, they just abandoned everything, just up sticks, and left all these tanks um, that were not suited for the terrain in the first place. Um, and it was, it's, it's very much uh, uh, a, a sort of a remnant of all the sort of different forms of conflict that, and, and invasions that the Afghans have experienced. So Ahmed Shir Masood, interestingly enough, he was assassinated um, the day before 9-11 by, um, by whom? We're not quite sure. Uh, he would probably be Al-Qaeda. He was, uh, being a warlord, he was an opponent of Al-Qaeda, and I think he was a bit dubious about the Taliban. Um, and he was actually assassinated the day before 9-11, martyred. And now he's a bit of a poster boy for um, the US. So that's why one of the reasons why we've got all these kind of posters of him um, because obviously he was used as propaganda um, for sort of disliking the Taliban more. Um, so lots of pictures of him around Afghanistan, wherever you go, people will have pictures of him in, these, in their cars and their taxis, uh, on billboards, um, literally everywhere. Uh, and then this was another outing I got to go on. This sounds like I just go on lots of outings when I go to um, a war zone. Uh, but I, I found it, I really enjoyed it because it's the equivalent of going to a coastal um, seaside to a British tourist resort. So me living in Hastings, um, obviously a, a tourist town built for leisure by the Victorians and most of our, a lot of our industry is geared towards tourism, tourism and care work. 
Um, I found it really interesting going to visit the Afghan equivalent of that. So obviously it's a landlocked country, so they don't have the sea, but they have this lake on the edge of um, Kabul. And you can see here, this is their equivalent of a beach hut. Uh, so beach huts are very exclusive things in Hastings. Um, you know, only if you're well off can you afford a beach hut here. And there's lots of different politics around um, beach huts. I can tell you that because I'm actually involved with the council. Um, but uh, I, I, I feel like the Afghan version of a beach hut is um, a lot more romantic. You can see there you've got curtains drawn across. Um, I actually got to go in one with some of my friends and we, we, we sat inside and there's cushions dotted around and you get, you can order things, you can order snacks, um, tea. There's, oh, you can also smoke the hookah as well whilst you're in there. And, um, you know, it's obviously a hotspot for, for people uh, wanting to have a romantic getaway or just or friends just hanging out. Um, and there's a sort of very hokey fairgrounds there, which I actually think, I went on one of the rides, not the boat ride, um, which looks like it hasn't had any sort of, you know, health and safety servicing in decades. It, in, Potentially, I think it's been there since the 70s. Um, and when I was on this ride, which was sort of like a swing that went round in circles on a, you know, suspended from um, a metal chain, I actually thought this is probably the most dangerous thing I've done in Afghanistan. And if I'm going to die, it's going to be on this rickety old swing that hasn't had a safety check in decades. Um, but I survived it and um, I, I lived to tell the tale. And it, um, I'll show you, I've got a little bit of footage, just, just a little snippet of, of what it's like at this, at this fairground. That's the swing I went on. <laughs> and this is, oh my goodness, the boat just was terrifying. You can see at the bottom, there's actually, you can't see, but there's a tire that's just a regular old tire that it's running back and forth on. And then you have to buy your snacks, buy some bread. It's quite similar to a British seaside town in that it, it's fallen into sort of deprivation. Like Hastings, you know, it's well past its heyday and we've, we, well, we've had a resurgence thanks to staycations. But um, you can see in the background there, there's actually some new large buildings popping up and I'm told that this is gentrification creeping in, that people, the well off, the 1% well off in Afghanistan are now starting to have little getaway um, lakeside houses. So very much like Hastings, places like Hastings that now we're sort of starting to feel the trickles of gentrification from London. Um, the same is happening in, interestingly, in, in Kabul. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Okay. So I thought I would start off with some of the the, the sort of heavier issues that exist in Afghanistan today. So as I sort of outlined in the first half, um, the, the turning point was in 1979 with the Russians um, invading. So you had 10 years of that and then five years of civil war and then another five, six years of the Taliban. And then since 2001, you've had NATO and US troops in the country. Um, and at the moment, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more um, further into the talk, but um, the, we've got peace uh, negotiations going on at the moment. But one of the aspects which um, people are sort of kind of unaware of is the, 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 the huge um, explosion of opium production in Afghanistan. So previously under the Taliban, there was roughly about 26% of the world's opium came from Afghanistan. I think they still exported some, some uh, because it was relatively lucrative, but under the Taliban, it was it's haram, so they it was very much frowned upon to produce it. So probably, if you were paying a big bribe and you were in the, with the Taliban, you were the one one of the few exporters. Um, but today, ninety percent of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan, and there's been um, a hum as you can imagine in a, a war torn country, there's been a huge spike in people um, becoming addicted to opium. So now. 10% um, of the population, it's calculated, has an opium addiction, so that's 3 million people. And this picture here, you can see, um, well, on top of the bridge, this is, this is kind of in the, in the background, you can see there's a bazaar, people shopping. 
Um, and then underneath the bridge, this is uh, one of the many rivers that ran through Kabul. And uh, I was told, you know, people have memories from the 60s and 70s of people swimming in this river and they would catch fish for their supper. Um, and it was very much this lifeline, but because of many reasons, mainly climate change, the water levels have plummeted in Afghanistan. And now what was once a, a luscious river is now um, a barren uh, bed which, which, which hosts full of rubbish, but then is also home to a lot of opium addicts who, who live under the bridge. So you might get talking to someone and maybe they will talk about normally their father and if they've become an addict, they'll say he, he went to live under the bridge. There's lots of different bridges um, along this riverway. And it's, it's a bit weird, like people sometimes line up and watch, watch, watch addicts, um, you know, because it, it's, it's such a sight that there's, a, there's an element of, there's a kind of voyeuristic element of, 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 of witness, witnessing that. Um, but interestingly, um, the, the, the solar revolution has actually um, doubled opium production in the last 10 years. So what's happened is that farmers have realized that by buying um, um, some solar panels, they can um, generate energy to pump water up to about 100 meters deep. So normally water wells in Afghanistan about tw 25 meters, 30, 40 meters deep. But these ones are now 100 meters deep. And thanks to the power of solar, they're pumping water up and they're irrigating the desert. So once where there was just a, a barren desert, not, very little growing, is now these like green expanses of, of opium. Um, and that is actually interestingly having a knock on effect in this country. So in, in Hastings and many coastal deprived coastal seaside towns mainly, um, there has been a, a sharp increase in heroin addicts. Um, and it's very, what's, what, from reports that I read, it's what's flooding in is this very high quality, cheap opium. Um, and obviously deprivation as in Afghanistan, it, um, opium thrives in deprivation in places like Hastings. So we have a, we have a, a big problem on our hands here and we're actually um, Public Health England has, has um, identified Hastings as being one of the towns in Britain that has a particular issue. And we're actually getting extra money from the Home Office, Operation ADA, um, to deal with it. We might even get a visit from Priti Patel. Um, so uh, this, this, even though you think, oh God, opium production in Afghanistan is awful, you think it might be limited to Afghanistan, but it's actually having a knock-on effect around the world. Um, refugees is another uh, huge problem. So internally, you've got 2.5, um, they've got 4 million refugees um, internally in Afghanistan and globally, they're 2.5 million. So they're the second biggest um, uh, global population after Syrians in the world. Um, and I've been to a few refugee camps and it's, it's and I've taken these photographs and it's, it's as bad as you can imagine of people living in, in squalid conditions, in mud huts. Um, I, people are really not going to cope with, with COVID. Social distancing is non-existent because you've got people, you know, eight or nine people living in a mud hut. There's hardly water for drinking, let alone hand washing. You can't self-isolate um, if, you've, if you've contracted COVID. You, you're just in this mud hut with all your family. So it, it's a really desperate situation. Um, for a lot of the refugees in Europe, they're being deported back to Afghanistan. There was an agreement uh, that was signed with the EU between um, the EU and Afghanistan. It's called the Joint Way Forward. And the Afghan government agreed to it. They felt, I think they felt lent upon because if they didn't agree to it, then they were worried that their aid from the EU would stop. Um, but basically this agreement allows EU countries, Britain included, to deport um, hundreds of Afghans back to back to Kabul and so for many they've never been to Afghanistan because they may have been born in Pakistan or Iran um, or if they are from Afghanistan they've definitely not been to Kabul before so they're being um, deported back to one of the most dangerous countries in the world and Kabul is now one of the most dangerous cities in the world um, to join some of the four million who are internally displaced living in various refugee camps across the country many many of which are in Kabul. Um, so women, obviously, it, it's very, when people think Afghanistan, they think the oppression of women, women in burqas. And you know, when I talk to women my age, I'm now 40. 
Um, if I was an Afghan woman, I'd probably have 10 kids. I'd be wearing a, a burqa. For, chances are I'd have like quite an oppressive husband. You do, you know, I don't want to generalize too much because I do meet very empowered women, mainly sort of middle class women who whose families might have been well off and they got to go to school. Um, and perhaps they often their, their parents were um, communists, so they were a bit more sort of progressive about That's um, it, yes. Because she was yes. showing a she was showing a photo in that oh, and boy. I couldn't see it for I know what you don't know. Oh okay. So somebody's saying they couldn't see the photo. I'm just going <laughs> to keep going and let the tech department work on that. Um, so yeah, I'm I, 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 if you can't see the photo, there are two photos up at the moment. Uh, one is a picture of some women in the indigo burqa, and the other is a small crowd of young women. And I'm actually the what what in that picture, but I, I'm the woman who's obviously the taller person <laughs> in that in that crowd of women. Um, and so, yeah, the situation, there has been a, a lot of gains for women in the last 19 years under occupation, especially for um, girls living in Kabul, uh, they've generally been able to access education. But uh, as was the case in the, the 1970s with all these pictures of young women in Kabul in short skirts and beehives, it's a very different situation to the cap from the capital city to the rural provinces. So I'm told that the young girls that wanted to go to school in sort of the more rural areas, perhaps they'd get to go for a few weeks, but then they'd experience intimidation from the community or pressure from home. Um, a lot of the time, these schools that were supposed to have been set up, that there was a US money or NATO money spent on setting up these schools, they were actually ghost schools. They never they never got built. Um, so there, there hasn't, there's, there's, a, there's quite a gulf between the experience of women in the rural provinces and women in Kabul, but certainly there's been these, these great gains um, for the generation sort of post 2001. Um, and they, the, these, I think these young women, they're the hope, the young people are the hope of Afghanistan um, to try and keep them on the path of, of progressing forward, of keeping their um, human rights, of keeping their uh, women's liberty. But it's it's there is a huge generational divide, say, from somebody my age, I'd be part of the older generation um, to to, you know, somebody who's a millennial. Um, so these are the peace talks that have been going on for the last two years. Um, they have mainly been hosted in Doha, Qatar, and there were a couple in Moscow as well. And it it basically includes uh, the Taliban. Um, and some some Mujahideen leaders and the um, um, Americans, um, and it's quite it's quite a bizarre gathering because it sort of mainly consists of these older men who have been trying to kill one another for the last thirty years gathered around the table in the Middle East, um, and they've been talking for the last two years about peace. So interestingly, although one of the, the pledges that the US and NATO made when they steamed into Afghanistan, they pro promised to liberate the women, they promised to topple the Taliban, and they promised to capture bin Laden. So 19 years later, they're now negotiating a power share with the Taliban, who never went away. They definitely knew how to play the long game, as in, as, you know, it, decades, centuries of experience of being invaded, they know that the mountain terrain is very tough for foreign invaders to understand and to fight in. And they played the long game. They disappeared into um, the rural expanse and they, they, they launched various sort of guerrilla warfare attacks on, on NATO and US troops over that period. And uh, when there was the official withdrawal in 2014, um, there was a big research by the Taliban and they've, they've managed to basically reclaim about two thirds of the country um, so they they are unofficially very much back in control. They've never really acknowledged the current government who were put into place by the US. They've kind of viewed them as this kind of puppet government. And the, the current government, the current government, they are sort of they're a funny mishmash of warlords and basically anyone who would work with the Americans. So a lot of these politicians, many to most, are are corrupt. They've got blood on their hands from the Civil War, um, and there's um, there was, there's a few exceptions, but um, uh, most of them are in it for their own personal lucrative gain. So we're now, they've now got to the point whereby the Taliban are willing to talk with the Afghan government. So that is positive. Uh, the American representative is um, 
uh, Zalme Khal Khalilzad, and he is the US, he's an Afghan, he's a, the US special um, envoy. Interestingly, he previously worked for the Rand Corporation. He was advisor for the gas, the uh, Trans-Afghan gas pipeline. So it's important to uh, remember that Afghanistan has a lot of um, precious uh, natural minerals just waiting to be mined. There's, there was a survey, a ge geological survey carried out uh, by a US, I can't remember the name, that it, it was carried out in 2011. They, they estimated between one and three trillion dollars worth of natural resources. So you've got things like copper, zinc, uranium, gold, a lot of rare earth metals that are really um, essential for um, you know, modern day devices, laptops, phones, uh, tablets, all that kind of thing. So there's 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 a lot of money potentially sitting in Afghanistan. And then the, you know, Donald Trump, the Americans, they're going to be very reluctant to completely withdraw from the country, um, remembering that it borders in the north, China, uh, their arch rivals. So um, Donald Trump has pledged that he wants to bring the troops home for Christmas. I'm sure this is part of his big sort of election campaign drive. There's currently 12,000 US soldiers in Afghanistan, it's roughly about 400 odd Brits. Um, and he wants to bring that down to 4,000 by the end of the year. To, to give an overview, the, the US have, have spent $822 billion in Afghanistan so far. And that's not even including the amount of money they're gonna have to spend on the aftercare of their personnel. Um, if they bother spending any aftercare. Certainly the, 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 the troops have been very overlooked both, both in this country and in the US. Lots of personnel coming back with PTSD injuries and not being properly taken care of by, by governments. Um, there was a, a calculation um, in 2013 that estimated that the UK had spent 37 billion pounds in Afghanistan, but that's, that's from the 2013, so it would be a lot more by then. Um, there's been 3,502 US and NATO uh, military personnel have been killed in the war and um, upward of 100,000 Afghans, um, that's, that's the conservative estimate. So um, as I mentioned before, Afghanistan is now classified as one of the most dangerous countries in the world um, and one of the, well, one of the least peaceful, uh, which is not surprising after 40, 40 years of warfare and now this, since in the last 19 years of, um, of violence between the Taliban, um, Afghan security forces and the foreign US and NATO um, forces as well. So during these peace talks, there was, there was one round where women were invited um, in a delegation to take part and to put their case forward highlighting the importance of women's rights, but it's not one of the key negotiating um, factors for, for the Americans. The, um, their sort of deal breakers is that there needs to be a power share between the Taliban and the current Afghan government, and that Taliban have to agree to never again host um, uh, international terrorists, Al Qaeda, ISIS. So I, the, I think the Taliban are, are, are probably up for agreeing to that. Um, they definitely have a lot of power in this situation um, in that they already control a lot of the country. So talking a little bit about um, some of the projects that I'm involved with. Um, so I, I explained a little bit that in Kabul, there was this, this peace center um, and then all these young people came and they got to sort of talk about nonviolence and, and uh, look at what was happening around the rest of the world. And they would run various sort of grassroots projects. They ran a street kids school. They um, had a course in permaculture. They would go into refugee camps and um, help to run permaculture courses there. Um, loads of different things going on. So some of the members who I've known since they were 14, 15, they've, they've grown up, they've gone to university, they've got married, and then they've returned to their home um, villages. And so this, these photographs are actually taken in Bamiyan. So what you can see there, the background, that's Bamiyan, quite different um, to Kabul in that it's, it's not polluted, uh, but obviously the trademark, the incredible breathtaking trademark mountains. And on the rooftop there, you can see um, this street kids school that's being run by one of the young volunteers who himself, Ali, is, is about 22, recently got married. 
Um, and he is running his own street kids school independently now. We've been trying to support him financially doing that. And as part of the, the, the project, the, the kids come off the streets for a day and they learn basic literacy and numeracy and a way of subsidizing the loss of their income and their to their family, because these, these kids, you know, are, are, are important part of the family's income base. They are subsidized monthly with a bag of rice and um, and a can of oil, which you can see there. I'm not sure what's in that box. We've got an extra thing on the go there. Um, maybe that's fuel or something. So yeah, that's what they're doing in Birmingham. And they're also, also a few months ago, Ali got into, he sent me a little video and some photographs of these solar pots, he calls them. And so somebody in his village has uh, have managed to sort of uh, retrofit these old satellite dishes um, and by, by sticking um, mirrors on them and making them into solar dishes. And you could, it takes 40 minutes to, um, to boil, I think it's five liters of water on one of these solar pots. So it's good for, you know, cooking, uh, boiling, a, boiling a kettle, or you can stick um, on the stove, you know, a, a pot of rice and some vegetables and over a couple of hours, it will just sort of sit in the sun and, and cook. So this is a real game changer for, for people on low income. Um, apparently the governor in their area said they're no longer allowed to go to the mountains to gather, gather brush. So that would be their normal form of fuel and how they would cook um, cook their food. So uh, these are a real lifeline for, for the Afghans in, in their village. And obviously um, it's, you don't recommend people sort of cutting down trees in this day and age. Um, and it's definitely better than bur potentially burning plastic um, to, to, for fuel. So as well as doing these solar pots, because they're very aware of climate change and um, looking to create a green environment, they're also tree planting um, so Afghanistan, they've, they've had a devastated um, tree cover over the last 40 years of war. So obviously people have been chopping down trees for fuel um, and, and they haven't been replanted because there's just been so much, uh, the country's just been destabled, destabilized, you know, you can't really get a tree planting campaign on the go. So um, they've, they've got, I think, I think it's like less than, about 3% of the country has tree cover now. So they are potentially heading for sort of a um, you know a disaster when all the the trees available um, for, for fuel no longer exist. So that there's so, that, so Ali has now started planting trees, and these are some of the trees there in, in the background. He gets some of the locals gets them involved as well in planting trees, and we send we send funds to him to do that as well. So I'm going to stop. Oh look, I'm ahead of time. I wasn't sure about timing. So we've got about 10, 15 minutes now. I wanted to stop and um, give you all an opportunity. There's normally lots of amazing questions um, in these sessions. So I'll give you all the opportunity to, to, to comment or ask a question. Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, I think with, well, Afghanistan has a, a very young population. So 65% of the population is under the age of 25. And these young people, they, you know, they have grown up with, with well, the ones in Kabul, uh, to an extent, people in the rural area, with an element of, of freedom and access to education. And it's these young people who don't want to return to the days of the Taliban under no circumstance. So obviously, the, 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 um, the picture of the peace talks, oh, someone's done uh, some red lines. <laughs> I don't know how that got there. <laughs> Peace talks, they're all the older generation sitting there and the government again is made up of the older generation of all these, you know, corrupt individuals who have profited through war. And, you know, these, you can say, oh, you know, the British and the Americans, they try to went, go in with the best of intentions, but, you know, critically speaking, why did they install in their government um, a bunch of older men with blood on their hands who were previously warlords who, who were corrupt individuals? You know, they knew the history of these people when they invited them to form a government. So um, I, I, I'm not very sympathetic when, well, I'm, I'm not really that open to the idea that, you know, the US and the UK went in there with the best of intentions. I think that's a, a, a misguidance. I think it was originally they thought Afghanistan was going to be a stepping stone into the Middle East. 
Um, and again, you know, this whole thing, Saddam Hussein, weapons of mass destruction, we know that was a lie now. We know that it was about access to oil fields. Uh, you know, before, before they invaded Afghanistan, there was 10 years of, of Iraq, there was 10 years of economic sanctions on Saddam Hussein's um, Iraq, which really crushed uh, the population, the civil society. Um, and it was to make Saddam Hussein cooperate with oil prices. So um, it hasn't been, I don't think foreign intervention has been that genuine in Afghanistan. They, they thought it was going to be a short-lived war. They, they underestimated the Taliban as not being, very, they thought they weren't very sophisticated. Um, but obviously they're, 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 they're rugged, and determined. Um, and so I would say, you know, encourage young people, support them, support their projects, try and lift up their voices. Um, they're very, in this booklet that I've, that I've put together um, it's on the last slide. Um, this is, it's got, it's got some interviews with young people, uh, Vox Pops that I, um, that I carried out about a year ago about the peace talks and they're all very dubious and they've, they've said, well, why have none of the young people been invited? Why have the women not been invited? Uh, it, it's a no brainer, isn't it? Just, it, it, just stop, stop kind of, focusing on all these um, older generation corrupt individuals who are not genuine about wanting to bring peace. They're all about lining their own pockets and, and cementing power and work more with, with um, younger people, you know, the real people, grassroots, uh, people from, from working class, uh, labouring backgrounds. So that, that would be my advice. And there's a lot of hope, you know, like these projects here, it, it proves that young people have a lot of tenacity um, and a lot of desire to improve their country and, and to help the most vulnerable in, in their country as well. Um, from the chat box, um, somebody has, well, someone's commented on the solar cooking, which is great. Um, I've seen that in Madagascar in a, in a school where they, you know, they, the pot cooks their lunch while they're all in school in the morning. Um, and Anthony Matthew, he's asked, how do you manage the language, Maya, when you're in Afghanistan? Um, there is a, there's, there's one of the coordinators uh, is fluent in English, so he often translates, but um, every, lots of young people who have managed to gain access to education, they are very keen on learning English. It's the, it's the being a translator is the number one uh, money earner in Afghanistan you can earn a lot of money so everyone there speaks well not everyone but the younger generation they all they all try to speak English or want to learn how to speak English and practice their English on you and um, want you to teach English so a lot of them they're, they're very you know um, they're, they're very fluent and um, normally I mean like most countries around the world people speak five or six languages and so they're you know, you talk to people there and they're like, oh yeah, I picked up Hindi from watching Bollywood movies and and they speak, they speak Dari, um, which is like a kind of, it's like a kind of Persian Farsi. And then they also speak um, Pashto, which is what the Pashtun tribe um, speak. And then, you know, people normally, there's also sort of other dialects that people speak as well. Uh, there's like Uzbeki and there's various dialects of Uzbeki, I'm told. Um, that sound completely different. So there's 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 lots of different languages going on, and people just pick them up very easily. It's just sort of British people. We have a we have a bit of a problem picking them up, but yeah, English is quite common. Thanks for that. And then um, Wendy has asked if um, she says, I presume there are no elections. Yeah, there have been elections, um, and they've they've. They're quite dubious in terms of how corrupt they are. So the last election that was last, I don't know if it was early this year or last year, and uh, there were these two contenders that normally go for it. Um, the, the, the current uh, president, Ashraf Ghani, and then the current prime minister, Abdullah Abdullah. And uh, whenever there's results, they both claim victory. And so a way, a way around it is that the Americans um, uh, steam in and then they say okay one of you is president and the other one's prime minister um, so I mean you have this kind of <laughs> these, the, the, you know the, the, the two men in charge who are disputing election results 
Um, so that's that's obviously a problem. So Ashraf Ghani at the moment is the president, uh, is the prime president, and Abdullah Abdullah is the prime minister. Abdullah Abdullah is the one who's now going to Doha for the peace talks. So they've divvied up, divvied up responsibility in that way. Um, but I'm told that uh, in the rural provinces, there's been a lot of intimidation at the um, polling stations, women especially um, are intimidated. There's, there's because there's high illiteracy that people have to turn up and they have a, they, they print their fingerprint to prove their identity. Um, and then at home, the women are sort of intimidated by members of their male members of their family to vote in a certain way. And often they don't even know who they're voting for. Um, there's stories of ballot boxes going missing and, and yeah, everything. So even though elections do take place, it is very dubious around how, um, how corrupt they are. It's, it's the, the results. And then who you're voting for, it's, it's, you know, it's a common story, like, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make that much of a difference who you're voting for. Um, so that's the situation there, but at least there are elections and there is sort of, you know, an attempt to, to sort of strengthen democracy and to have some sort of democratic system. Yeah, so um, in it's on the issue of people being deported. I mean, in Leicester here, where we are, we have a lot of Af Afghan asylum seekers. Yeah. Um, and some of the stories are just heartbreaking. Well, I guess all of them are heartbreaking. Um, but I mean, what do you know? It's quite shocking to think that people, you know, risk being deported. It, do you know, I mean, how is that? It sounds like there was this kind of dodgy deal which you said about with the EU and and uh, Afghanistan, the Afghanistan authorities. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's a huge question, isn't it? But what, how, you know, what, what can we do <laughs> to try and avoid this happening? Mm. Um, it's really hard. I mean, um, nobody, none of the EU countries want to take responsibility for Afghans. Technically, we're no longer at war with with the country um, and you know that the, the just not the sort of they don't want to take responsibility for what ha what they've been involved with basically for the last 19 years and there are you know these this 2.5 million displaced um, across the world so there, there were previously I think a million and a half in Pakistan and Iran and they are now slowly being deported. So they, Pakistan and Iran no longer want these Afghan refugees either. So yeah, the country is being flooded and it, yeah, the joint way forward deal, it was a dodgy deal. Um, it's really difficult because there's not a lot of publicity around Afghanistan, obviously right, understandably and rightly, there's been a lot of, you know, publicity around Syria and to an extent Sudan and there's more sort of sympathy towards those refugees. But for Afghans, no, it's a different story. And it's, it's technically is considered, Kabul is considered a safe destination to return people to because of this dodgy deal wh whereby the Afghan government were lent upon to say, yes, you can deport back here. Um, so, I mean, right, right to, the, to the home office, um, right to your MP. Um, get to know your Afghan refugees and your community, support them, create campaigns for them, um, help them, enable them to form links in their community so that when it does happen that they're potentially going to be deported, that you can sort of mobilise a campaign around them. Um, yeah, and try and create as much as possible a community um, and involve them in your community, I would say. Yeah, um, and of course in Leicester, you know, we have the Leicester City of Sanctuary, mm -hmm. which John is very involved with. Um, and we also have this After 18 group, um, which tr supports um, Afghan, Afghan children who are basically get reaching the age, who come unaccompanied and they're reaching the age of 18. And then there's a huge risk that even though they've perhaps been living here with foster families for four, five, six, seven years, 
Um, no one left in Afghanistan, and yet, you know, they risk being deported. And it's absolutely heartbreaking, some of the stories. Yeah. Um, and a guy who John is friend, befriended at the moment, he, um, his mother, you know, she begged him to leave because his father was a member of the Taliban and wanted him to get, you know, join and... Um, mm. And he and this guy, we had a very moving story from him recently that he thought his brother had been killed. He'd kind of disappeared. He and they, I don't know whether they were informed that he died, but anyway, they they all thought he was dead. And just recently he had a phone call from his brother, who's managed to get to Iran. He managed to well, I think he was liberated from the prison, from the by, prison the government, by the government forces. By the government yeah. forces. The Taliban prison. Um, but oh, yeah. so now he's got this, you know, this, he's heard from his brother. But his brother was using somebody else's phone. Um, so we're now just anxiously waiting to see if he hears again from him. Um, so, yeah, it's just heartbreaking. And, you know, when you look at the history, as you, that was brilliant the way you went through all that for us. Um, you know, it was the women had the vote, didn't they? Yeah, it is overwhelming. And I mean, obviously, I'm in contact with a lot of my Afghan friends through Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, you know, and you get immediate messages from them about calling, becoming ill because of coronavirus or, you know, personal problems happening in their lives. And it is really hard because it's such a, you know, helpless situation and there isn't much future for Afghans, especially young Afghans. So, you know, I get messages, hey, Maya, is there any way you can help me come to Britain? I really want to come. And it's like, oh, it's, even if yeah. you get you probably get deported, it's like, you know, traveling across land, you know, making that journey months, and then you probably get stuck in Calais, and then you have to jump a truck, and then it's, you know, it's so dicey. But lots of lots of young people really want out because there is no there isn't they can't see a future for themselves in Afghanistan you know the, the unemployment is through the roof and you know so much poverty so much violence it's a really depressing it's very wearing when I go there I mean I only really go for two weeks normally and then when I get back I'm I'm normally quite depressed for about a week it takes me a while to sort of get out of that sort of yeah. oh God, feeling overwhelmed you know, all these, all my young friends that I've known now for about 10 years, and I've seen them grow up, and they're incredible, inspiring individuals, and I just think, you know, what, what is their future, but I mean, they, they, they press on, so I've got, I've got to, I've got to press on with them, and be there for them, and um, support them in their projects, and, you know, being, being proactive in terms of, you know, grassroots activities, working with street kids and planting trees, that's really good for their mental health to do that. Like it's, a, you know, it's good for everyone. And so for me to sort of, you know, raise awareness and to generate funding for them is, you know, that helps me feel like I'm doing something positive. Um, but yeah, it's quite, it's extremely overwhelming when you look at the big picture and you think, oh my word. But they're, you know, they're living their lives, they're happy. Well, to an extent happy, you know, they're getting married and some of them are expecting children now. And it's, yeah, it's wonderful to, to, to watch them. It's, you know, knowing them from they were 14 and 15 and now they're, you know, all grown up, married with kids and jobs. And that's, you know, it's nice to watch that as well and to see people manage to go forward in life under such, you know, adverse conditions. It's, it's quite inspiring at the same time. Indeed. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I've managed to um, bring back a couple of small rugs in my suitcase, believe it or not, stuff them into my suitcase. It's still very much a, a roaring trade. Um, and there's a part of, there's a market, chicken market in Kabul. It used to be, you know, the go-to place for all the tourists back in the day. And they have loads of sort of carpet um, shops there. And there's a lot that go to export. I think they're kind of, they are transported to Pakistan and then um, packaged up in sort of shipping containers and, and transported around the world. So there's, there's still a big sort of carpet market. Um, and yeah, they're, they're incredible, exquisite carpets that the Afghans make. And there's, 
yeah, there's still a lot of goat farming and um, I think there's probably sheep farming. I mean, I, I don't get to leave Afghanistan, uh, Kabul very often, so I don't see what goes on. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it is mainly subsistence farming in, in the rural provinces and they will be, you know, sh herding sheep is, and goats is one of the, the key things, um, key activities for Afghans. So yeah, there's definitely still a, a wool industry on the go, but at the same time, they have been, like a lot of the world, been flooded with imports from China. So they're right next to China and they get all these horrible, cheap, tacky bits of plastic. So whenever I want to do my sort of tourist shopping, I want my authentic Afghan, you know, rugs or my ornaments. It's really hard to find because it's all made in, it's all tack made in China. But I mean, that's the, the plight of everyone around the world, isn't it? When you want to buy your authentic um souvenir you look on the back and it normally says made in china <laughs> yeah. so um yeah they 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 are still producing but it's a i think it is becoming more of a, a rarity it's harder to export they can't fly things out directly from afghanistan it has to go through pakistan and obviously the number of times it changes hands and it gets more expensive um but there's lots of these like kind of fair trade you know the kind of fair trade shops they're most likely to have Afghan rugs and stuff like that. And what about kite, kite flying? You know, we always associate Afghanistan yeah. with kite flying, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, have interestingly, we started a campaign called Fly Kites Not Drones, and it's very yeah. Penny Walker in Leicester. She was one of the main mm. movers behind that as well in um, you know highlighting the campaign and we started wow. that and i think two, we launched it in 2012 with our afghan friends um and that was because there was a, a rise in the use of weaponized drones so i'm not sure if you are aware of this but the the us uh, mainly the us um and then britain started to employ them as well we're using these unmanned aerial vehicles that you know fly around can fly around in the sky for 24 hours without um, having to land and the pilot is in um, a military base um, in either the US in Nevada um, or in the case of Britain in RAF Waddington which is in Lincoln and so I would often go to to Lincoln with with um, Penny and we would fly kites uh, because we were we the, the campaign was to was to to highlight the fact that children in Afghanistan are now too afraid to fly their kites because of the threat of weaponized drones um so yeah we would fly kites outside of the the military base and we would get groups to do that as well and then we created with the quakers a peace education pack um which is now used in schools for teachers we've got lots of workshops to help young people understand how weaponized drones work and to help them empathize with young people who live under drones so they extend but kite flying afghans love kite flying and uh, I've done a little bit of kite flying with them and it is really, they are experts, but I mean, it's quite cutthroat because they could, they could put like this kind of glass on the strings to cut down their opponents. So, you know, you have these competitions and everyone goes to the hillside and you're like, you know, trying to get your kite to fly high and then you can take out your opponent by, you know, cutting their string with your string that has glass on it. So it's, it's pretty brutal. And I've, got, I've brought back a load of kites in the past, the kind of papery ones. I've managed to bring them back and to sell them. And then I've brought back some of the string and the string is really, it's very abrasive. It can definitely probably, you know, cut your fingers up if you were <laughs> if you didn't have gloves on. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic pastime. Um, and yeah, people are still very much into kite flying. Mm. I remember a kite flying event held in the, in Victoria Park with the Afghan community. I, I wasn't very good at it, but oh. it was a bit of fun. It wasn't windy enough, was it, that day? Well, I, I, was, I was interested in all the talk you had about the pollution in uh, Kabul. I was just wondering whether, do you get many cyclists over there trying to... Oh, yeah. Pollution level? Yeah, you do. There's a lot oh. of people cycling, because cycling is obviously very cheap, and it's incredible. You see people cycling along on these rickety bikes and people giving backies and... You know, like in India, uh, you get people piling, whole families piling onto a, a moped. Uh, it's a bit like that in Afghanistan as well. You can, you can get like, you know, a whole family on a moped or two or three people on a bike. Um, 
So, and I, I'm amazed because I'm a cyclist like everywhere, and uh, the the paths are scary because they're you know they're not they're not concreted or anything. They haven't got tarmac. The pothole central, but people seem to still manage to get around on these rickety bikes that you know somehow survive. Um, yeah, that's a really it's a it's a a, a key form of transport. And uh, well, the Afghan Peace Volunteers, the peace group that I work with, they did a, a flash mob bike ride one day for International Women's Day. And so they they bought and hired a whole load of bikes and took them to the peace center. And then for weeks, the, the young women, um, well, teenage girls, they were practicing bike riding because you're not, as a woman, you're not allowed to ride a bike in Afghanistan. So they didn't know how to. So in the peace center, in the little sort of yard garden area, they were sort of practicing riding their bike, riding their bike for, for weeks. And then on International Women's Day, they um, a mixed group of boys and girls cycled through Kabul. There was about 30 of them with their blue scarves all cycling through Kabul on their bicycles in a flash mob, um, which is like super scandalous for, for young girls to be riding a bike, uh, not to mention young girls mixed with young boys. So they did that as an action for International Women's Day. And that was, you know, very heartening. I, I arrived the day that they did that and it was, it was brilliant to them all coming back. Um, yeah, so yeah, bike riding is big, big industry. Going back to what you were saying about the opium uh, dependency, um, does that affect women as well? Do they get involved in that? And yeah. is there any, are there any healthcare services? I guess there probably aren't, but are there any addiction services? Or? Yeah, I mean, women, women there are uh, female addicts as well, but normally they don't, they don't tend to go under the bridge. There's, from what I'm told, there's often like little sort of more sort of um, areas to the side, like a tent that the women go into, which is interesting. So even when you're, you've got addiction issues, there's still segregation between genders going on. Um, there's various sort of independent projects going on. There's, well, where, where we normally stay in Cartesse, there is a, um, uh, a, a cafe that's run by uh, recovered addicts and the it's called the Taj Begum and it's run by a very formidable woman um I think her name is Layla and she's there's lots of articles that have been written by her because she takes in these drug addicts but they have to be you know uh, recouping drug addicts and she gives them a job as sort of you know in this cafe and you go into the cafe I've been in it a few times and it's you know you go there's a sort of like a basement area and there's lots of sort of cushions and it's a very you know more progressive environment to be in with men and women mixing and and um it's more sort of you know you can sense that there's a it's a sort of a, a, a hub where people can kind of discuss and maybe talk about and think about more progressive ideas um and it is all run by recovered drug addicts so she's someone who is you know very well known in the community she's received death threats for her work but very formidable character there are some rehab centres. It seems like the, the cure is mainly sort of cold turkey, lock you in a room for a few weeks and you go kind of cold turkey. Um, but there isn't any sort of state run, um, you know, facilities for addicts. You have to have a relative who will go to the bridge, drag you out from underneath the bridge and then put you in a rehab and pay for the rehab. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Hmm. how easy is it for you to travel there and get a visa yeah it's really it's pretty it's more straightforward than you think so there's there's several commercial companies that still fly there so um turkish airlines um gulf air and emirates those are the free airlines from the uk that you can take to fly there um and i normally Go Turkish Airlines because it's cheaper and you stop off in Istanbul and if there's a layover oh I always dream of a layover because then you get put in a hotel and then you can go for a hammam and yeah get the massage and all whatnot I love that um I always try and get a layover <laughs> that's my top tip layovers in Istanbul um so that's fairly straightforward getting a visa you go to the embassy in Knightsbridge it's near the Natural History Museum and uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's quite expensive. It's one of the most expensive visas on the market. I think it's 100 and, 120 pounds now for a visa. We get, we get tourist visas. Um, and we always say that we're staying in a hotel. 
um, but you need to have a letter of invitation from someone or an organization. Uh oh, don't put this on the internet though, John. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah, you get your letter of invitation to say that, um, you know, someone in Afghanistan is going to be hosting you and will look after you. That's quite key. So you need to have, you know, a friend who, or an organization who will say, this person's under my care. And then at the car, at the Afghan embassy in Knightsbridge, you have to write a disclaimer saying that, you know, if you're kidnapped, you don't expect the Afghan um, government to help you. Uh, if you're killed, um, you're not expecting them to ship your body back. So those are, it's a bit, uh, you have to write that disclaimer and submit that with your with your visa application, which is you know it's a bit unusual, but you, you get used to it. Um, yeah, it's yeah it's it's easier than you think though. And there was some there were some sort of um, package holiday deals to Bamiyam, I think, and it was like a sort of skiing holiday. Um, they were sort of starting to get back into that a while ago, I think. But I think with the increase now of the Taliban, I'm not sure if that's still happening. Um, but yeah, at one point there was sort of like adventure skiing holidays in, in Bamiyan. Um, and there were some flights, I think there's one flight a week flying internally from Kabul to various other places like Bamiyan or Kandahar or Jalalabad. So yeah, there are some internal flights for the, for the well-off Afghans or for the internationals, because the roads are not at all safe. If you travel by road, it's, it's very risky, you know, your, your bus can regularly, there aren't trains for a start, uh, everything is sort of bus vehicle. Um, if your bus gets stopped by the Taliban and searched, people have to show their ID, there's been stories of people, you know, killed on the roadside if they've ended up having student ID or some sort of connection with the Afghan government, you know, the Taliban will execute you. So, you know, for me to travel on the roads would be really super risky, unless I wore a burqa. And pretended I was mute, um, which some of my Afghan friends have suggested I do in order to go and visit other places, but <laughs> haven't fancied it. Um, but yeah, you can fly, you can fly um, internally, but very few and far between flights. I'm sure Maya must be very tired. When I mean, do you have any kind of hopes about when you might be able to go again, Maya? Yeah, I don't have any immediate plans to go. I do feel, well, obviously because of the pandemic, it's, it's very dicey to go at the moment. So, you know, I get text messages from my friends regularly saying that they've, they've become sick. Um, so, you know, obviously in one of the most polluted cities in the world, I don't fancy getting a, you know, respiratory virus. So I don't have any plans to go. Um, it will be interesting to see how these peace talks unfold, uh, what the new Af what the new um, government will look like, the power share between the current government and the Taliban. Um, you know, the Taliban are sort of promising to be more um, liberal, um, especially towards women's rights, but we'll, we'll see the fact that that's not on the agenda at the peace talks is, is quite telling. So I would love to see my friends again, and I really want to go to Bamiyan to see their, their projects, all their solar pots and their tree planting. I'd much prefer to go there rather than go to Kabul. It's, it's, it's so oppressive, Kabul. It's so polluted. Um, so many street kids, so many refugee camps. Um, it's, it's a really, really tough, gritty city. So, yeah, my preference would be to visit Bamiyan. And um, if, if possible in the future, I'd like to do that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, as I said, the hope is with, with all these young people who are determined, you know, to, to change their country and they, you know, for, for them, it's sort of like there's no other option. They, they can't really, they know what the plight is like if you become a refugee, um, if you flee the country and try and make it to Europe. They know, you know, people are well aware now that their chances of getting asylum in a European country is fairly slim. So a lot of people have resigned themselves to, you know, this is my future, I'll be in, Af in Afghanistan for the rest of my life, and I'm just going to give it my all to improve this country. And, well, there's, there's a, there is more of a movement forming as well with the Afghan diaspora, um, you know, across the world, who are now wanting to give back to Afghanistan, sending money back, starting projects. So that's an interesting sort of developing area now. Um, you know, Afghans who've grown up or you know, come over here sort of in their teens and now have got citizenship, 
are earning money and professionals, they're now wanting to make a difference. So that, yeah, that's, I think that's a hopeful avenue as well. Thank you. That's a good positive note to end on, I guess, Maya, isn't it? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. And uh, yeah, we'll look me. forward to <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all of you who've rejoined and um, look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Uh, thanks, yes, Maya. Thank Keep you. in touch. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Great thank talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Be in touch, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.